Good morning, and welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. This morning marks the start of a new book on Inquisition Update. Uh, new to Inquisition Update, not certainly not new to the Christian world. The title of the book is Rome and Civil Liberty. The full title is Rome and Civil Liberty or the Papal Aggression in its Relation to the Sovereignty of the Queen and the Independence of the Nation. It's written by Reverend James Aitken Wiley of Scotland. J.A. Wiley, as he's commonly known, and his those who love him referred to him lovingly as the Prince of Historians. And having last week concluded the final pages of the Global Vatican by former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney, in his book, The Global Vatican, where he not only admits, but he boasts that the Vatican controls the United States both foreign and domestic policy, and is literally the god of this world. He controls all the governments of the world. Having concluded that book, I find this book by James Aiken Wiley a, a perfect follow-on. The question you would ask is, how in the world did the Vatican gain so much controlling power in the United States of America, a country which, for all intents and purposes, is a Protestant nation, or was, how has the papacy become the master of our government? And the question is asked, has it ever happened before that the papacy would attempt to get control of the government of a Protestant nation? And the answer is absolutely yes, and that's what this book is about. Again, it's called Rome and Civil Liberty, or the Papal Aggression in its Relation to the Sovereignty of the Queen and the Independence of the Nation. That's right. Before there was colonial USA, there was Protestant Great Britain. And, Pro and Great Britain, unlike the United States of America, was Protestant by law. They had suffered many attempts to overthrow the government by the Roman Catholic Church, by the papacy, and they simply made England Protestant by law. And the Queen of England, whoever ascended the throne, had to swear an oath. And the coronation oath of the Queen of England asserted under oath that she was Protestant and that she had no, in swearing the oath to, to England and to the Protestant Church, that she would have no mental reservation or purpose of evasion, indicating that not only did England acknowledge her common enemy as the papacy, but provided a clause in the coronation oath that guaranteed that there was no Jesuitical mental reservation. In other words, they were not practicing in their mind as they swore that oath that they were that their oath that they were swearing was not an oath at all you see in jesuitry england being perfectly familiar with jesuit casuistry and sophistry knew that in roman catholic canon law if one swore an oath that denied the papacy as the king of kings and the lord of lords, then it was no oath at all. 
and that it was unlawful for any king to swear an oath uh, putting aside papal authority. Well, the coronation oath of England guaranteed that the that the, the, the one being sworn in would maintain the Protestant faith and would not use Jesuit sophistries in swearing that oath so that the, they would be bound by that oath. Now a Jesuit teaches, and Rome, the Roman Catholic Church teaches officially, that if you ascend to a position of a king or a queen, and you swear an oath of fealty to the people and not to the Pope, you have, you have committed a perjury. But a Jesuit goes even further that if you hold in your mind at the time of the swearing-in some mental reservation or some purpose of evasion, that you have not sworn an oath at all. It's as if you had never sworn an oath. And you were ipso facto released from that oath. And that's why we see, as in the case of uh, Queen Mary, uh, Bloody Mary, as she was known, the Roman Catholic who swore an oath uh, to uh, to ascend the the uh, the Queen's chair, the throne of England. She was Catholic in heart. Her oath wasn't an oath at all, and she ruled at the behest of the papacy. And Protestants died. She persecuted God's people. Okay, <clears throat> there. Having set the stage that England had learned her lesson, had kicked the Jesuits out of the country, had made the, the country officially Protestant, even though there were Catholics living in the land, they had suppressed Roman Catholicism, they closed the churches, they turned them into Protestant churches, and uh, the king and queen swore Protestant oaths, and uh, Rome was left exiled from England, had no control. And so Rome set about to re-establish Roman Catholicism as the religion of England. Okay, now the assertions that I made, the numerous, numerous assertions that I made in reading the book, uh, The Global Vatican, will be confirmed in your mind when we read this book that I wasn't just speaking from an anti-Catholic point of view, I was speaking from a Protestant point of view. And you're going to see that Protestant point of view from a Protestant of Scotland, James A. Wiley. Now, a little bit before we, could be, uh, before we uh, uh, continue reading the book, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I wish to read familiarize you a bit with James Aitken Wiley. And by the way, his name, his middle name is spelled A-I-T-K-E-N. And this book, by the way, before I go any further, this book is an online version. So you don't have to go out and order this book if you can find a copy of it. You can just simply read it right online with me. And to get to be on the same page with me, just simply go to, to uh, or rather go to your favorite search engine. I use Google all the time. And type in J.A. Wiley, Civil Liberty, or rather Rome and Civil Liberty. And then you'll come to the Google Books uh, version of this, of, of this book, and you can read it right alongside with me. Just go to Google Books and type in the title, Rome and Civil Liberty, by J.A. Wiley, and then you can follow along with me. Now, I'm going to read a bit from the Wikipedia page for James Aiken Wiley. This is from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia online. James Aiken Wiley, 1808 to 1890, was a Scottish historian of religion and Presbyterian minister. He was a prolific writer and is most famous for writing The History of Protestantism. That's the name of his most respected work, The History of Protestantism. And by the way, if you're a longtime listener of Inquisition Update, I rarely make a, a request uh, from my listeners. I, I, 
I, my philosophy is what God gives me, I freely give. And my work here at Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio is a work of love. It's my reasonable service. And so I take nothing for my efforts. The blessings that I receive, the spiritual blessings, what I receive for doing this work is payment enough for me until I receive my my crown of glory from my Lord in heaven. But I'm going to make a request from my listeners, a personal, if you would like to, to support Tom Fress of Inquisition Update, I would make a request that if you have a copy, a, 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 a good quality, nothing tattered and torn and, and, and worthy of the trash bin, but if you've got a good, workable quality, uh, copy of the history of protestantism by james a wiley please contact me by email and i'd like to purchase it or even take it as a gift if you feel if you if the lord leads you to do so and i'll give you my mailing address i would dearly love to have a full copy of the history of protestantism by james a wiley to add to my protestant library now continuing with the wikipedia on James Aiken Wiley. He says, Wiley was born in Kiramuir, Scotland, on the 9th of August, 1808, and his father, James Aiken, was an Auld Licht anti burger minister in the original Secession Church. Wiley was educated at Mariscal College, University of Aberdeen, where he stayed for three years before studying at St. Andrews under Thomas Chalmers. He followed his father's example, or uh, entering the original Secession Divinity Hall of Edinburgh in 1829, and was ordained in 1831. He became sub-editor of the Edinburgh Witness in 1846. In 1852, after joining the Free Church of Scotland, Wiley edited their Free Church record until 1860. He published his book, The Papacy, Its History, Dogmas, Genius, and Prospects, in 1851. And by the way, if you've got a copy of that one, I'd certainly love to have it too. Many of his works are, are online, <clears throat> just like this particular book that we're going to read. So, But I particularly love hard copy books to read here on Inquisition Update. And in this case, I have to read one that's online. It's difficult for me, but... That's only because I'm very clumsy on a computer. <clears throat> now, uh, he became sub-editor of the Edinburgh Witness in 1846, and in 19, or rather 1852, after joining the Free Church of Scotland, Wiley edited their Free Church record on eight, in 18, until 1860. Excuse me. He published his book, The Papacy, Its History, Dogmas, genius and prospects in 1851 winning a prize of a hundred guinea from the evangelical alliance would to god that there was such thing in this country today the evangelical or rather protestant alliance it says the protestant institute appointed him lecturer on popery in 1860 he continued in this role until his death in 1890, publishing in, in 1888 his work, The Papacy is the Antichrist. Now that book, particularly, we read word for word and, and discussed right here on Inquisition Update, and you can find it in the archives at First Amendment Radio. The Papacy is the Antichrist by James A. Wiley. This belief that the papacy is the Antichrist is what made James A. Wiley a true Protestant. You cannot call yourself a Protestant unless you have that belief that the papacy is the Antichrist. Okay? So I would ask my listeners the question, how many Protestants are there today in the United States of America? it would be very, very difficult to call the United States of America a Protestant nation today. 
And as we've pointed out many times here on Inquisition Update, during the colonial period and the formation of this country, it was almost unanimously Protestant, except for one small colony that was Roman Catholic, and that was Maryland. Okay? Now, he continues, he says, he, he died with his history of the Scottish nation taken forward to 1286. So James Aiken Wiley is regarded as the prince of historians because of his historical books. The books that I've already referenced here, the history of the Scottish nation and the history of Protestantism are must-reads. They are simply history that Rome has taken away from us. That's why the titles of these books are so new to us. The history of Protestantism and the history of the Scottish nation are Protestant works. And we don't know of them because our government has become Catholic and our churches have become Catholic. They no longer believe that the papacy is the Antichrist. And why do they not believe that the papacy is the Antichrist? Because they have no proof to make their assertions because these books have been removed from the education system, both in the state and federal funded schools and also in the state-controlled churches, the 501c3 churches. Okay, Inquisition Update is about restoring true biblical Protestantism to this country. And as a small voice as it is, it's the beginning of something huge. If there's ever to be liberty ever enjoyed again in this country, it could only come about because of a return to Protestant Christianity. We will never comprehend in our minds who the tyrant of this country is, who it is that's taking away our civil liberties, who is in control of every facet of communication in this world from from the mainstream medias to the alternative medias to the schools to the churches to Hollywood television every every source of information that we get preaches a catholic mentality and we can't even recognize the degree to which we have been indoctrinated until we return to what was known commonly in the Protestant world. You cannot know you are in darkness if you have never seen the light. Rome has successfully quenched the light of Protestantism in this country. Precious few Americans comprehend how dark the darkness is because they've never seen the light of Protestantism. And that's what I intend to do. Turn on the light. If God gives me strength and First Amendment Radio gives me the time, we're going to turn on the Protestant light and then you will know how deeply darkened our indoctrination is. Now, continuing, it says, Aberdeen University awarded James Aiken Wiley an honorary doctorate in 1856. Wiley's classic work, The History of Protestantism, went out of print in 1920s. You have to ask yourself, why did The History of Protestantism by James Aiken Wiley go out of print in the 1920s? It's a premier Protestant work. Because Protestantism was dying. The light had been dimmed. And they simply quit printing Protestant work in this country. He says the history of Protestantism went out of print in 1920s, although it was briefly reprinted in Northern Ireland. Now, Northern Ireland is Protestant. South Ireland, the southern portion of Ireland, is Roman Catholic. That's why we see this continual aggression and fighting between the Protestants and the Catholics in Ireland. Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. This is where Protestantism still lives. 
and there's no and there is conflict with the Roman Catholic Church, conflict with the 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 tyrant from the Tiber. All right. He says it was briefly reprinted in Northern Ireland in a two-volume reproduction in the late 20th century. It has received praise from a number of influential figures, including Ian Paisley. Ian Paisley, the great Protestant preacher from Northern Ireland who has recently deceased. He's a hero of Protestantism. Would to God that from coast to coast and border to border there were countless Ian Paisleys in this country. It says the history of Protestantism was also reprinted by Heartland Publications in Rapidan, Virginia, USA in 2002 in volumes, uh, in four volumes. James Aiken Wiley died May 1st, 1890 and is buried with his wife, Euphemia Gray, who lived from 1808 to 1845, and their children in the East Preston Street Burial Ground, Edinburgh, in the eastern part of the southeast section. The great Protestant historian, James Aiken Wiley, and it is a blessing from Almighty God that I get to read yet another one of his works here on First Amendment Radio. Now with that, now I'll continue. Rome and civil liberty, or the papal aggression in its relation to the sovereignty of the queen and the independence of the nation by J.A. Wiley. If you're following along and uh, online with me, we'll begin with the title, To the People of Scotland. It begins with a letter to the people of Scotland. He says, to you, my beloved countrymen, I dedicate the Scotch edition of a work which the generous liberality of an unknown friend in England has made accessible to you, uh, to all of you, and which other motives than those of vanity make me especially desirous all of you should peruse. It is with a deep sense of my own unworthiness and of the many imperfections attaching doubtless to this performance that I presume on this dedicatory address. But I am moved thereto in part by the following consideration. Ever since the era of the papal aggression of the Free Church of Scotland has had an eye, in the, found, had an eye the founding of an institute in which the youth of our land and more especially those of them in training in our universities and theological halls for the office of the holy ministry might receive a systematic initiation into the distinctive doctrines of popery and Protestantism. Now, J.A. Wiley wanted to start an institute as a response to the attempt of the Roman Catholic Church to gain control of the government of England by very subtle means, and that's what this whole book is about, is how Rome attempted to get control of the Protestant government in England. As a result of that papal aggression, Wiley wanted to start an institute, a Protestant institute, where the very distinct differences between Roman Catholicism, which he calls popery, that is Pope worship, and Protestantism could be given side by side so that the upcoming generations would know, be able to recognize in the world the hand of popery trying to destroy the Protestant Reformation. It was needed in Scotland and it's needed especially in the United States of America today because the very papal aggression that took place in England is now taking place in the United States. Okay, welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Hey, and if you'd like to... Uh, if you'd like to support First Amendment Radio, or rather, Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio. I'm not sure. I think I heard Nicholas uh, speak. Yeah, Tom, you did hear me. Okay. 
I just wanted to let your listeners know, and you know that uh, that the link to the book is at inquisitionupdate.org, and there's also a link there to the entire J. A. Wiley Library. Oh, fantastic! From archive.org, very good copies, very readable. It's right. just just wonderful to have a link that people could read right along with me on the program. So go to inquisitionupdate.org. And there you'll find the links to click on to, to read this book along with me. Thank you, Nicholas. I appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Now, he says, ever since the era of the papal aggression, the Free Church of Scotland has had an eye, or rather a desire, to, to found an institute in which the youth of our land and more especially those of them in training in our universities and theological halls for the office of the holy ministry might receive a systematic initiation into the distinctive doctrines of popery and protestantism okay first of all <clears throat> i want to inform my listeners why scotland called its protestant church the free church of scotland because they were liberated by Christ. They had formerly been tyrannized by the papacy, forced to be Roman Catholic, and the Protestant Reformation liberated them from the tyrant of the Tiber, and they were free to worship Christ and Him only. And their conscience, formed by the Scriptures, was their guide. That's why they called it the Free Church of Scotland. And any church that is not free, as was the Free Church of Scotland, is not a church of Jesus Christ. It is a church of the tyrant from the Tiber. It's a papal church. Now, they may call them even themselves evangelical. They may call themselves Protestant but if they are not free to preach against the Antichrist of the Bible, they are not a free church. And I'll just tell you, 501c3 churches, by whatever name, are not free to denounce the papacy as the Antichrist. They are not free to be Protestant churches. They are not free to worship Christ and Him alone. And you have but one option, either to make that church free by getting rid of the 501c3 and the 501c3 board of directors and the 501c3 preachers, or get out of that church. There's no other alternatives. Okay? This is a war of annihilation against Protestantism. It is government-sanctioned. It forms the very basis of our government. The object of our government is to destroy Protestantism in this land, to destroy freedom in this land. And it's because of a cozy, more than that, an, a marriage bed relationship between our government and the papacy. And I've given you ample proof of that through the reading of the book, The Global Vatican, by U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney. No one can argue with me on that point. That came from a Roman Catholic author's pen. Not a Protestant. That was a Catholic author. Now, we, if we have learned one thing from that book... It is that the papacy, the tyrant from the Tiber, controls our government lock, stock, and barrel today. And the government-sponsored war, the papal-sponsored war against Protestantism is being led by our government. That's why our government is taking away our civil liberties. And you're going to see that this papal aggression that that... James Aiken Wiley is talking about is the very same thing that the papacy tried to do in England and Scotland and, and Ireland that they did, that they accomplished here in the United States of America. 
That's why this book is so important, and it's such a fantastic follow-on to the previous book that I read and concluded just last week. He says, ever since the era of the papal aggression, the Free Church of Scotland has had an eye of founding an institute in which the youth of our land, and more especially those of them in training in our university and theological halls for the office of the holy ministry, might receive a systematic initiation into the distinctive doctrines of popery and Protestantism. All right, James Aiken Wiley is telling you that Rome made an assault against the Free Church of Scotland, against the Free Protestant Government of England, and tried to put it all back under the tyranny of Rome. And James Aiken Wiley had a solution, and that is to create an institute where Protestantism and Roman Catholicism were taught side by side so people could see the difference. So that they could compare the light of Protestantism with the darkness of Romanism. And he hit it right on the head. That's exactly how to restore Protestantism in this country. And that's the effort that Inquisition Update has been conducting here on First Amendment Radio from the very beginning. To first teach you what Protestantism is, and to compare it side by side with the diabolical doctrines of Rome. So that you don't need me to point out Rome's hand in the world. You can see it for yourself. What I freely receive from the Lord, I freely give. And we cannot put a, co a price on this message. And we cannot keep it to ourselves. The very salvation, the very continuation of our freedom demands that we be about the Father's business in showing Christ versus Antichrist until everybody can recognize the difference. It's everybody's job. You can't delegate this, this, this preoccupation to someone else. We all have to be warriors for Christ. And that means we have to be warriors against Antichrist. We have to sound the, the trumpet of warning in this country before it's too late. And many would tell me, Tom, it's already too late. It's already too late. The new world order is already up and running. We signed the documents of Vatican Council II. It's become the law of the land. Rome rules. But maybe we can learn something. Maybe we can revive our, our understanding by reading this book. What Protestants did in Protestant Great Britain when Rome tried to do in Great Britain what she has succeeded in doing in this country. All right. He says, uh, ever since the era of the papal aggression, the Free Church of Scotland has had an eye, the founding of an institute in which the youth of our land, and more especially, those of them in training in our universities and theological halls for the office of the holy ministry might receive a systematic initiation, a systematic education into the distinctive doctrines, that is, the different doctrines of popery and Protestantism. Okay, they want to show the distinctive differences between the doctrines of popery and Protestantism. He says, a committee was appointed charged with this object. In 1861, the matter was found to be so far advanced that the Free Presbytery of Edinburgh, at its meeting of October 30th, 19, uh, 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 October 30th, adopted and entered on its record a resolution from which the following is an extract. Quote, the Presbytery did and hereby do appoint 
the Reverend Dr. James Aitken Wiley as lecturer or professor in the Protestant Institute of Scotland, it being understood that his tenure of office shall be the same as that of the ministers of this church, unquote. <clears throat> so they not only created this institute, this Protestant institute, where the youth of that nation, and particularly those training for the Protestant ministry, would be able to see side by side the doctrines of Protestantism versus the doctrines of popery. Okay? Education. This was a true education. This was not a liberal arts education. This was not a Roman education. This was not an ecumenical education. This was a Protestant education. It was based on the scripture. It was based on history. And it was based on the principle that those who profess the Protestant religion ought to know against whom they protest. It's a Protestant institute, and there ought, to, there ought to be one in this country so that everybody can see side by side the light of Protestantism and the darkness of popery. To make the choice virtually automatic, to remove the ignorance and blindness of this country, to virtually undo all that was done at the ecumenical Second Vatican Council. That's what we need, a Protestant institute in this country. Would to God there were always one in this country. Now he says, accordingly, on the 5th of November thereafter, I was, by appointment of the Presbytery, inducted into my office as professor to the Institute. Dr. Ch Dr. Chandlidge preaching and Dr. Begg making a statement ex ex explanatory of the object, while the presence of the representatives from the other Protestant bodies expressed the concurrence and cooperation. All right? So there were other Protestant denominations, but they concurred and they cooperated with this Protestant institute. There was no Protestant infighting over who should lead this Protestant institute. And for whatever differences the various Protestant churches of, of Scotland had, they were nothing in comparison to the importance of getting together and to concur and to cooperate with this Protestant institution. All right, it had the full support of all the Protestant churches. And he says, of this committee, the Reverend Dr. Begg was governor, and by his great practical sagacity and indefatigable efforts, largely contributed towards the realization of the enterprise. So that university, that institution was established. And he says, he said it, it expressed the concurrent, the, the, the other Protestant bodies in the country expressed the concurrence and cooperation of all the churches in the erection of the institute. As now, by furnishing directors, they share in the management of the Protestant Institute of Scotland. And it says, by the blessing of God, on my humble labors, the classes in the Institute have steadily increased. The number of students, session by session, now averages between 100 and 150. They are drawn from all Protestant denominations of Scotland, and they have entered with great enthusiasm and marked success upon the study of the subject selected upon. The subject, again, being the side-by-side -side comparison of the light of Protestantism and the diabolical doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, these, this, these bodies of students were, were brought into a competition, and there were five prizes offered. 
and the people, the children, or the, the the people in this institute, the students in this is institute, won all but one of those awards. This was a very prestigious school, and he says this trust. I regard as one that is connected with it the highest responsibility. The highest responsibility. That's what he called this institution. The highest responsibility. And it is just as important for us as it was for Scotland, even more so. He says, at your hands, my beloved countrymen, have I accepted it. And for the interests of our common Protestantism shall I ever strive to discharge it. It is as standing in this relation to you and bound to devote my time and thought to this question that I now present you with this treatise, this book that we're about to read. He says, I earnestly pray you to weigh its effects and reasonings. They are prompted by no sectarian jealousy. I speak urged by love of our native land by unfeigned devotion to the cause of liberty, civil and religious, and by a supreme desire for the preservation of the gospel and all its purity in a country which above most is it has illumined with its lights and enriched with its blessings. Okay? Speaking about the Protestantism of, Ireland, of, of Scotland. And he says, you, the people of Scotland, have ever occupied a conspicuous position in the battle of the Protestant Reformation. You were more purely reformed at the first than any other people. Okay, this is James Aiken Wiley telling the people of, of, of Scotland that they were above all other peoples in Europe after the Protestant Reformation, they were more purely reformed than any other. He says, you pledged yourself to this cause by solemn oath and, con and, and covenant. You were endured in its behalf a long and bloody persecution. That's right. Where God's people are, there is persecution. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And the Scotland Protestants suffered the persecution of Rome. Okay? It says in days of darkness, that's when Rome was in control, he says in days of darkness you struggled against arbitrary power. That's what they call popery, arbitrary power, and your contendings largely aided in achieving the revolution of 1688. So the revolution of 1688 was a Protestant endeavor, a revolution against Rome. He says, I know that the heroic spirit which of your spurned papistry and tyranny from our borders still lives among you. And I am confident that in the crisis that has again uh, uh, arisen, you will act a part worthy of the confessors and martyrs your ancestors and of your own hereditary relation to a cause which is nothing less than that of the maintenance of the gospel and of liberty of our in our country okay james aiken wiley says scotland was liberated because they cast off the iron chains of rome they cast off roman catholicism and they basked in the light of protestantism it was because of their bravery and their faith that they overthrew the papacy and he is warning them that once again rome is trying to get control trying to put the the iron chains of tyranny back on the of the scottish people and their answer was a Protestant institution. Okay? And he's encouraging the Scottish people to rise up and, 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 and take weapons against their age-old enemy, popery. Okay? What Protestant pastor in this country that ever got one moment's time on the mainstream media ever challenged Protestants to take up the war against popery in this country. 
Where was the James Aiken Wiley of the United States of America? That's a question. That's not a rhetorical question. Where was the Protestant voice? And if it's too late, even if it's too late, I intend to raise the Protestant voice on First Amendment radio. And to sound the warning, Francis Rooney told us the truth. In the global Vatican, Francis Rooney told us the truth. Rome rules this country lock, stock, and barrel. And we've either got one of two choices. We either fight or we die. Or we die fighting. But I don't fear him who can destroy my body. I only fear him who, after killing, can destroy both body and soul in hell. Scotland rose to the challenge. They sided with Christ against Antichrist, and we must do the same in the United States of America. And it's never too late to repent of our ecumenism and of our mistaken belief that the papacy or Roman Catholicism is somehow in any way Christian. Now he begins the preface, this is on page Roman numeral 5 if you're following along. He says it is a common error to suppose because Rome is unchangeable in her dogmas that she is unchangeable also in the forms of her logic. Okay? Let me explain what he's saying. The Church of Rome is prophesied in the Bible to be what it is. And it is prophesied in the Bible that it will be what it is today, what it has ever been, until Christ returns. It is irreformable. It is unchangeable. And Rome brags and boasts that it never changes. But that is not to say that Rome does not change her tactics. That does not imply that Rome never changes her disguise. Her direction, her warfare is always the same unchangeable. It is against Christ. It is antichrist. It is counterfeit to Christ. It is a counterfeit to deceive God's people. And it is Satan's weapon in the world. The papacy is, the, is not the vicar of Christ. It is the vicar of Satan himself. It is the papacy who saw all the kings of the world, all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them all. And then he bowed down and worshipped Satan so that he could be the king of those nations. It is the papacy who, after Jesus rejected that offer in his 40 days of temptation, it is the papacy who took Satan up on his proposal. It is the papacy that calls itself the vicar of Christ, that is in fact and in truth and in demonstrable witness in this world, the vicar of Satan himself. That will never change. That church is irreformable. To try to reform that church is to go against the written word of Almighty God. So we don't seek to reform the Roman Catholic Church. We just seek to battle it. And we're, we, we are aware of her many disguises. And we must, whenever Rome changes her clothes, whenever she 
washes her face and puts on new makeup, whenever she picks up a different kind of weapon, we can still recognize who it is. All right. He says it is a common error to suppose, because Rome is unchangeable in her dogmas, that she is unchangeable also in the forms of her logic. Society is continually advancing to a higher stage. Truth is perpetually receiving clearer manifestations. And this imposes upon that church, that is the church of Rome, which seeks to stereotype the one and extinguish the other, the necessity of continually devising new modes of assault. Okay? James Aiken Wiley knew how Rome operated. She never changes. She only changes her tactics. And he's about to describe in this book how Rome was changing her tactics at the time. Now let me tell you how Rome changed her tactics in our time. All of a sudden she took on a conciliatory face to those that she burned at the stake during the old world order. She said, you are no longer heretics, but separated brethren. And we're going to give you a period of time, now that you believe in futurism and not that the Pope is the Antichrist, we're going to give you a period of time to come back to the church, and we're going to welcome you. We're not going to be kill you anymore. We're not going to call you heretics anymore. And they lured us right back into the synagogue of Satan, and now they control our government just as Francis Rooney described. See what happened? We were deceived when Rome washed her face and changed her garments, but she was still the whore of Revelation chapter 17. We'll be back tomorrow to continue our reading by James A. Wiley, Rome and Civil Liberty. <laughs>